Hey everyone, Derek here from Badgerland Birding. Today we're with Tyler Hoare and Matt Young from the Finch Research Network talking about the winter finch forecast this year. Always an exciting time. Uh, so a little bit, if you're unfamiliar with the finch forecast, basically it's compiled to say, are we going to have these eruptive finches come down into the U.S.? What kind of numbers might they come in? Um, so it's exciting to see what we may be looking at here in the future. So um, it was originally compiled by Ron Pittaway, who unfortunately passed away, but he did a great job with it. These guys have taken over the role. So big shoes to fill. Guys, what are we in for this year? Siskins. Siskins, Siskins. Siskins and Siskins. I like that. Yeah, some this year it was a mosaic of some areas the birds are moving, some areas they weren't. It's all the food crops other than Alaska and Newfoundland, they were spotty and localized for the most of the finches. There's a good spruce crop on either coast, and then it drops down as you go through. Because remember last year, half of the boreal forest, basically northwestern Ontario to almost Alaska had a huge bumper spruce crop event, which basically pulled all the white wing crossbills and apparently found out after pulled all the red poles in with, with the siskins too. Those trees this year, they're done. They're pretty much resting right now. And the cone crop in the West is not so great. And the interior in the East, honestly, the 3,200 kilometers I drove over Labor Day weekend, it looked like the white spruce were on strike this year. They just had very little cone crop. The tamaracks have not had a good cone crop since 2019. They just seem that what food was there will not hold the finches. Gotcha. So then a lot of this is like, if there's not good food in the north, then stuff's going to move down into yeah. where we are, right? Or like white wing crossbills, they'll swing east or west. This year they came, they just basically split. We either went to Alaska, went to Newfoundland area and the maritime provinces. Okay. Cool. So let's go down kind of the list. Um, but before we get into that too much, I know people are probably wondering, like, how have the fires up there affected any of this? Truly, we had a very bad forest fire season. The amount of boil at forest that's actually damaged is quite small compared to the whole spectrum. I, When I did my cone crop marathon four-day drive through northeastern Ontario and western Quebec, I went and checked out four big burn area were the same as the cone crops 100 kilometers away 200 kilometers away from the burns there just wasn't much there localizing these burns what cone crop was there was probably minimal this year during the burn the jack pines that are there will be opening up so crossbills probably will be looking in those burns at the burnt jack pines future wise it'll probably they'll probably will I'll be avoiding these burns in the in the future years as succession goes on. But overall, but overall not going to have a big. They didn't have, they didn't have a food have source a big... there. Yeah, they didn't have the food source right there, so they weren't really there to begin. Yeah, there was no big cone crop and, like last year. The area that burned this year mostly had a big cone crop last year, and nothing this year. So okay, so it's not like they northwest they burned a bunch of food that they were going to use, right? Yeah. yeah. From a crossbill perspective, the burns will actually open up those cones on jack pine. The jack pine seed is actually more accessible now, so it's it's almost counterintuitive to what you know you would think from what we're hearing in the media, to some degree. Okay, so there's some benefit to it then. People who are evening grow speak lovers and the purple finches, all that. A lot of them in the Quebec, the eastern spruce bottom outbreaks. Other than two big burns most of the the uh these populations were south of the big burns okay yeah. cool they were very minima minimally affected the one thing for gross beak lovers and people who like spruce budworm warblers in my surveys this summer in the bo boreal now i found budworm outbreaks where they weren't not last year they were much more widespread in ontario so they're expanding pretty quickly westward so Expect more of the uh, budworm finches and budworm warblers in the future years. Okay. Yeah, so those, po those populations are on the rise still to some degree at least. And so we're, we're in a cycle where, yeah, these finches should be building in population to some degree. How much, we don't know. Okay. You know? Awesome. And let's get into kind of the individual species accounts here for the finch forecast. So let's start with the... Matt, hoary red pole is still a thing, right? We haven't had any lumping yet. No, it's kind it's kind of interesting because you know I'm writing, you know, me and Lily and Stokes are writing a book, and 
you know, when we're going back and forth, we're like, is this thing going to be a, are they going to be one species? Are they going to be two species when the book comes out? Mm-hmm. And that paper was now published two years ago. I think it was November, December of 2021, where they suggested or the evidence seemed to show it was one species. But I don't believe there's been any kind of proposal to even lump them at this point, an official proposal. Go Either ahead. way, they're still still separate as of now. And when they does the are... when does the book come out, Matt? Uh, the book's supposed to be out a year from now, so awesome. right around next yeah, right around next year, um, it's supposed to be out. So, yeah, I don't know when. Uh, we'll see if they get proposed to be lumped or not. But as of now, there's still two species. Cool. So, what does the outlook like for these red poles? This year is a above average alder crop from coast to coast across the boreal, which red poles will happily feed on. But the adjacent spruce white spruce, black spruce, and white birch crops up in the boreal are pretty poor. So I'm expecting a moderate flight coming down because I don't think they, they all can hold all the red poles. I'm expecting them to start showing up in late November, early December, poking around. Okay, yeah, so the- moderate then, possibly. Yeah. If they surprise me, I'd be quite happy. Yeah, it'd be nice, especially, uh, I mean, you had a great one two winters ago over in your area, I believe, Derek, um, yeah. in Western Great Lakes. It was fabulous. I always so appreciate North- them. Yeah, Northeast, we had a pretty good one in the super flight year, um, but not in a great sense then. Gotcha. All right, well, let's move on to our next category here. We have the Red Crossbow. Oh, they have come. They have come <laughs> east from the west in late June, early July, and they were all over the place in late July. The east side of the Great Lakes, there is a, into the maritime northeastern states, there is a massing event in white eastern white pine, which pulled a lot of Red Cross bills home. A lot of the ones in the west have come home, and they're pretty widespread here from Lake Superior eastward right now. Matt, this is your bird. Yeah, yeah, so... Type twos and fours. We get a few twos in the east every year, but twos, western type twos and type fours that are found in the west coast or the, you know, some of the interior western states have come in massive numbers this year. And, uh, you know, all the records I can look at, combing the literature, combing all the recordings in North America and all audio collections. There has been no uh, event like Type 4 in the northeastern states like this since at least the mid-90s, if not going back to 1970. So it's the largest eruption in my life, in our lifetime, uh, for Type 4. Um, there's also evidence, there's some evidence now that Type 3s are starting to come too. So we're going to have a lot of a variety of call, crossbill call types wandering around the east this year, uh, and, and a few of those are western call types. Now, type 12 has been kind of doing its thing, this northeastern call type that we, the Finch Research Network described a year ago, and we're still working on that paper um, with some more details, but that one has been through the northeast. You know, that one's around every year, it seems, for the last couple of decade or two now so um yeah it's interesting it'll be fun to you know record your cross bills this year everybody and send them send them to you right yes yep yep Put, uh, send uh, an email to me or you know you also could spend, send a lot of people send them to tim spar as well who's vice president of the finch research network and we identify a lot of them um but yeah send them to us because you could you could get four or five call types this year in the east Awesome. And those are probably going to stay like through the winter, the crossbills. I would, you know, it all depends that white pine doesn't tend to hold its seed crop, even in massive years, as well as some species, but it's so large that I can't imagine they won't find seed in the white pine, at least to some degree. But once that, that crop gets, you know, depleted, um, they're probably going to then start to switch to the hard pines, the red pines, the jack pines, the pitch pines, the Japanese black pine along the coast, the east coast. Um, they're going to hit those 
pines that are we call the hard pines that hold their seed the longest through the year through the cone cycle year yeah anyway, that's ahead. probably what makes predicting this stuff so tough right because there's so many different trees involved and finches yeah. are so nomadic and all that and then you have to look at the flowering of the trees and yeah like one event i had in north of montreal we had great white pine crop and all of a sudden there was nothing not a single cone of, or berry of anything any bush tree or anything for probably 50 square miles did a radius survey and also you start finding them again well I figured that event is probably that area had a very heavy late frost which killed all the flowering for that year in that area so yeah we have to not just look at the the birds we have to look at the trees when they flower the weathering events around i sit there in may and i look for frost warnings across the board yeah. trying to figure out the time yeah, and heavy heavy rain in May and June will actually be good for the softer cone conifers, the ones that form the cone crop, like the spruces and the hemlocks and the larches. That's at least one of the drivers on a good cone crop is a wet, wet kind of late spring into early summer. Um, this year, you know, it's a mixed bag kind of. As, as Tyler said in the, or in the beginning there, the cone crops are variable on those. You know, um, I think, uh, as Tyler has mentioned, well, you didn't mention yet, but the coastal uh, red spruce and white spruce is pretty good cone crop. But once you get in the interior sections, the cone crop really starts to go down on spruces. Same thing with hemlock. It's very spotty, at least down here. Do you see any hemlock uh, cone crop up your way at all, Tyler? Uh, poor. We've had, we haven't really had a good hemlock crop in several years. Gotcha. Gotcha. Unfortunately, the one of the native trees that again stressed by uh, invasive uh, insects or disease. Uh, that's right. Woolly adelgia yeah. has kind of affected our, our uh, continues to affect eastern hemlock. Um, what about our white wing crossbills? Oh, they put on a nice event when they decide to leave the western boil in June. They streamed up to Alaska, but the ones when they were leaving the big cone crop in the west, exhausted that. I was working in the boreal forest north of Lake Superior in the end of June, and I was having flock after flock after flock all day long of white wing crossbills heading eastward. I had a little bit of cone crop. They had no desire to stop. They were on a mission going somewhere. And then I found out from one of our cone crop reporters in Newfoundland, that's where they were going because they had a big bumper white spruce crop. And then hearing people from the maritime provinces in Canada about having a great spruce crop there too. That's where so many white wings left. Thing is, the white, there's still white wings up there when I was up there at the beginning of September, but they're small flocks and they're just roaming around trying to find some food source. Seeing that the, the crop is generally poor, actually absent of poor and white spruce, and below average on black spruce and tamarack is quite poor too. They're just roaming around trying to find a food source that can hold them for a while. So I expect a lot of small flocks roaming around throughout the winter in the boreal and dropping some flocks dropping south of the boreal in search of anything. So if you see a tree, an ornamental stand of nice Norway spruce with cones, I would watch that. In the during the winter, probably more towards the late winter, as they try to find what they can find, as they exhaust the limited stuff they have in the east. Okay. And there's been a, there's been small flocks of them in the red spruce, which is a northeastern only spruce, uh, in in the Maritimes in Maine and uh, Adirondacks in New York. Probably, I think there was a few. Wasn't weren't there a flight that went through the Upper Great Lakes in summer too this year? Or no, I could be mistaken on that. They, a small flock. When I was working on North Shore Lake Superior, 20 miles north, we were having flock after flock and talking to people who were working in Provincial Park, waiting on Lake Superior shoreline. They're saying they're getting a couple hundred each morning coming through. Nice. Okay. A lot um, of mission. No desire to stop anytime soon. They wanted to go someplace. How about our pine grosbeaks? One of my personal favorites. Pine grosbeaks. The the uh, fruiting crop in the east is quite good. It's actually, I, I tasted a bunch of fruit just to see if it wasn't too dry this September. Yeah. That's dedication right there. It's dedication. And 
when I take the mountain ash and actually looking at bear scats too to see what the bears are eating. If they're really hitting the mountain ash, I know they don't have any other food source really, but they didn't look at that. So there's a lot of mountain ash crop and berries, berry crops in the Northeast. West of Superior, there's a mountain ash crop and other berries, but generally the reports I'm getting it's below average. So in the East, I don't expect, East of Lake Superior, I don't expect pine grow sticks really to leave the boreal or leave just south of the boreal. They're probably, some will drift into the traditional areas in the lower Great Lakes forest. But in the West, I think there'll be more showing up in Minnesota, maybe some into Wisconsin and cities in Western Canada with, uh, have the ornamental mountain ashes. I think they'll be drifting into there as, as winter progresses. Gotcha. And then kind of continuing the gross beak theme, what about evenings? Evenings in the East, they are doing nothing. They're quite Dang. content where they are <laughs> right now. They had great budworms. <laughs> I was surveying just north of Algonquin Park in the end of July, and we were watching family after family of evening gross beak young being fed to the adults before feeding them choke cherries. Mm -hmm. And that area there has such a bumper crop of choke cherries all through the St. Lawrence Valley over towards Sault Ste. Marie area. The, the bushes were bending over. And when I was up there in September, usually there should be any choke cherries. The crop didn't even look like it was touched. There's that many berries there. Plus there's maple seeds, beech seeds, oaks. There's a great crop of deciduous food there for those birds. And Tadasac Bird Observatory, when they do the, start doing their surveys, their morning flight surveys in late August, it's a great little uh, heads up on what's going to, what the evening gross speaks you're gonna do. Their flights in late August, early September were very poor and for purple finches. There was not much movement. And when I go to the boreal in Labor Day weekend, it's it's anecdotal, but it tends to be when I go in, in there and I see evening grow speaks on a flight year, they're in the villages, they're in the towns, they're like hell sparrows <laughs> sitting, and feeding, picking grit off the side of the road in downtown of these little villages. But when it's not a flight year, they're nowhere to be seen in these towns and villages. And this year, mm -hmm. I couldn't find any in these villages, but they're out in the forest quite happily roaming around. More towards the west, the ones in western, northwestern Ontario, northern Man Minnesota, Manitoba, and all that. I expect more movement of them. Just the crop doesn't seem to be so great, the soft deciduous crop. So I think more will pop into more northern Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, up to western Canada, and some of the Rockies will move out south or to the lowlands. Okay. Gotcha. So there's some hope for you. Yeah. So I mean, I you. should be happy they have plenty of food, you know, like, I don't want to be selfish yeah. that I'm not going to see them, but like, they're always cool to see. I, I, uh, I don't think people, those big flight years when we get, in Southern Ontario, we get hundreds fly by us at Hawk Watch in, in the days in late October. I don't think that's really going to happen this year. I think they're going to, in the east, it's going to settle over in, in the northern states, southern, central Canada, but there's not going to be much movement. But you might have into the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And in some of Wisconsin, you might have a movement of the birds that are in the budworm outbreaks in northeastern Ontario. Because if they come down heading southwest and miss the big choke cherry crop, if they hit more Lake Superior north of Lake Huron and then come down, they're going to miss a lot of this choke cherry crop there. Okay. So they might they might do a, a small flight into the UP. Gotcha. And 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 just to br uh, you know bring Ron a little bit into this that that's the your reaction to the gross beaks coming or not coming, you know, Ron would always quote, it can be a long winter without our finches. And that's what, <laughs> you know, really made, you know, the whole finch forecast and the legion of fans that love finches and us launching the finch research network, a possibility, a possibility really. So anyway, it's a classic re in response. Oh, we're not going to have, <laughs> but you know, they're going to be doing well at least. So I'm like, it's already a long winter. I need something colorful to look at, you know? I know. I know. Oh, totally. All right. Well, let's move on to the purple finches. The purple finch in the East are behaving just like the evening gross speaks. They seem to have no desire to move. They're just quite happy. However, right. they've had strong flights of them by, of hundreds flying by the Duluth Hawkwatch. So northwestern Ontario, Manitoba, a lot of those purple finches are heading south. They don't have a food source and they've already decided to go south. 
and how far they may get down in the central part of the United States. You might even see them south in Iowa, maybe into Missouri, Arkansas, because they, they're pushing south. They have no desire to be in Canada, in northwestern Ontario, it seems. It's very interesting. You, you go, you know, east, like you said, Tyler said, you know, even Grosbeak Peak, purple finches aren't moving at all. But Minnesota, Hawk, you know, Hawk Ridge, the purple finches have been moving. The only one moving on all three fronts, because we when we watch this, you look, you kind of watch Hawk, Hawk Ridge, you watch Whitefish Point in Michigan, and you watch Tautasac. Siskin is the only one that's been moving. Uh, across that whole broad kind of stretch and that's really materialized in the last few days the most yes so speaking of that what's our pine siskin prediction they're going to, they seem to be in the last 10 days they woke up but in the last couple of days they've really moved like yesterday between whitefish point and tadisac they had over twelve thousand pine siskins heading out they had a few thousand again this morning they are leave. They don't have the white spruce crop. They don't have the food source they want in the boreal. So they decide it's time to go. They've eaten what budworm larvae they could find, and they're just going for a flight. I'm expecting them to. Some will stay around. Some will probably more show up, move back north in January to the earth feeders. But I think there'll be a much further push south. Okay, we they're did probably, have. They're probably the, they're the bird this winter. We did have south. some flyover ones in Milwaukee, like couple days ago so i mean that kind of checks out with with that push too yeah yeah they might they might go deep into the so deep cell. what, yeah. I, what i'm kind of gathering that's like the big story is like it should be pretty good for pine siskins for us right heading south yeah yeah they okay. might they might overshoot the great lakes but they well, i found in 2020 when we had a big flight they pushed south but then i started getting them on my feeder and on the north shore of lake ontario in january two three by the end of January, I had 40, 50. And they were staying with me. They are just slowly accumulating in the feeder as winter progressed. Awesome. And they're, you know, they're a, they're a big driver of, you know, seed sales. And, you know, I think, yeah, the, as Tyler said, they're going to be the big one, the big player at feeders in the eastern, you know, probably the eastern half, which this forecast is mainly kind of focused on the eastern half of the continent anyway, but. I think, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be shocked if uh, Siskins make a deep push this year. I think that's uh, that's the one. I think awesome. they're make a, they're going to make a push from the coast, Atlantic coast, all the way well into the Midwest, heading south. Yeah. And who knows what they're going to do in the mountains yet? Yeah, I mean, in the super flight year, there was a coast to coast flight, so I don't know if that'll happen again. But there hasn't been a Siskin flight since the super flight in 2020, 2021. So we were due. It's been okay. three years since there's been a Siskin flight in the east of any kind of numbers with any kind of numbers. So awesome. And what about those eruptive passerines? Um, let's see. Blue jays are just like the purple finches right now okay. in the east. They're doing nothing in the east. Duluth has had huge numbers, thousands of them go by there. Again, the food source that they want, like the purple finches want, it just isn't there. In northwestern Ontario, and Manitoba, and the central boreal, in that area that they want, so they're leaving. But the eastern boreal, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, lowlands area, they're like, I don't care to move. I've had, I usually get hundreds, if not a few thousand, come by my house on a flight year. I am up to, I had four flocks totaling 21, 22 birds I've seen so far come over my house. They just have no desire to do much. The nut hatches, Areas where the spruce budworm has not damaged the balsam firs, the balsam firs are having a pretty good crop. Those cones, however, break apart pretty quickly and pretty easily. But nut hatches love it because they can go all through the spruce tree probing for these seeds. So area, I expect most of the nut hatches to stay north close to the boreal, but a small flight of, of them heading south of birds that primarily come from more of a budworm area where they just don't have, didn't have a, a seed crop of balsam fir. And Bohemians, like the pine grows bakes, they do have a food source up north. You, you'll probably see them move more in the west, Lake Superior westward than the east, and are probably more as winter progresses. But I don't expect them to be really pushing for ourselves this year. 
Okay. I feel like a lot of people, oh, sorry to cut you off, Matt, but I feel like a lot of people don't understand Blue Jays are eruptive to some degree because they'll just be like, ah, the Blue Jays left my yard. Like, you know, they just kind of see it as like a regular backyard bird. They don't really think about that eruptive aspect to them. Because, yeah, once you get around the Great Lakes areas, we have our resident population. And then in the winter, our residents can move and all these boreal Blue Jays come down to replace them. Or, or like last year in the east, we had a very poor food deciduous seed crop for them, so they left. We lost them. Blue jays got out of the woods here in the eastern boreal and in mixed forest quickly, and they were a hard bird to find sometimes. Just to calm they, everyone down, their least concern, right? We don't, we're not worried about no, blue jays. no, 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 okay. no. They, they, and they're also kind of tied to acorn crops to some extent, not not exclusively, but they're a big oak follower, so. Yeah, the cone crop, as he said, you know, eastward, they're not moving. Westward, they're moving more. Uh, the red-breasted nuthatches will also hammer that that eastern white pine crop as well pretty pretty hard. So I expect there'll be densities of red, red-breasted nuthatches in the very large eastern white pine crop. But other than that, there'll be, there won't be a big south push of them, I don't believe. Cool. Well, I'm I'm excited for finch season. It definitely makes winter a little more interesting. Um, anything else to add from you guys about the forecast? We'll definitely link it in uh, you know the description and a pinned comments. So people can check it out and check out other stuff by the Finch Research Network. Matt's got one of the shirts. Um, I love the Finch Research gear. Looks great. So you can get yourself a, a Finch themed shirt as well. Yeah, I think everybody will have a little bit of something to you know a Finch or two to to enjoy this winter. Most mm-hmm. people will. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not going to be a massive flight year, but it'll everybody will have a little something to get it, you know, to look at. I think. Yeah. Everyone depends on where you are. Go everyone ahead. will have something different. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much for talking with us. Uh, looking forward to seeing what we can find this winter. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Of course. Yeah.